this is the way the world is, isn't it? Able to reach out to folk all around the world. Zoom is not uncommon anymore. It's it's brilliant. So thanks very much for connecting and coming on for a chat. No, no problem. No problem. I really appreciate it. Um, but you're obviously well versed. I've been sort of going through the archives of Conrad Smith on podcasts and listening to bits and pieces and such an established career. How is life these days? Are we obviously several years now since the All Blacks and life sort of a different pace, I would have thought, these days. How are things? How's the day-to-day? How's work life and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, it's 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 been it's been good. I've um yeah, I've obviously been through uh well, I finished with with the All Blacks and um carried on playing in, in France and um that that carried on, you know, for probably I think three seasons, two and a half seasons. And um and yeah, and then stayed in France and was working with the club and started to work with uh, the Players Association, which I'd had a long um <clears throat> history with, um, both as a player and then, you know, when I stopped playing, I stayed stayed involved. And then with COVID of uh I came back to New Zealand and for originally for a three months and that turned into a year and a half and still going and um, but carried on the work so yeah I'm, I'm keeping busy and still working and um, staying involved in the game which is which is cool yeah and, and so you were in France when Covid hit yeah yeah, yeah. so we um, we gutsed it out over there for about uh, a year um, went through a lockdown over there which was pretty tough and and then it was in that yeah just before Christmas at the end of um, well going back yeah, year and a half now. Um, just hadn't been home obviously for a while. Was was missing home. With, got had a young family. The the club president let me go for it was it was going to be a three month break. Um, but yeah, during that time, that's when things sort of got pretty nasty up in Europe. And there was at that stage, there was, New Zealand was totally COVID free. So yeah, um, yeah, it was it was a. Hard decision not to come back, but also an easy one given the circumstances. So, and the president was really good. The club, they just said, "Look, stay where you are. We're not. We don't expect you to come back." Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, I've I've been um, here ever since, and still miss it there. Still got a house <laughs> in Po in France that I'd like to get back to one day. But um, yeah, for now, it's uh, the family's pretty happy, so we've sort of settled down here. And how um, how did you take to the, the French lifestyle? The sort of inside a changing room in in in, in France compared to uh, an all blacks changing yeah. room is that a little bit more relaxed? Yeah, I lo- I, lo- I loved the the whole French experience. Um, the the I, I knew I'd love the French life. Um, my wife and I, to be honest, like that's why I went. You know, I wasn't. Um, I'd pretty much. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd had a good crack with the of of rugby in New Zealand. Um, I didn't want. To, to be living the all black life because um, with the young family, because it is a lot of time away from home. Uh, so we, we wanted to travel and then the opportunity to play in a, a smaller club, you know, with a coach that I knew uh, that that was the real appeal and the attraction. Um, and, and, you know, obviously living in, living in France, learning a language. And then what, what surprised me was the rugby itself. I, I really enjoyed and that was probably down to the, the club and how welcoming they were to, you know, the, myself and the family. And, uh, yeah, it, it was great. It was certainly, it's certainly different. Certainly, you know, um, the, the rugby life is different than, than what it is in New Zealand. But, yeah, I, I loved it. And as I said before, I ended up playing longer than I <clears throat> thought I would. And, and that was because I was enjoying the time and then, and then stayed with the club and did a bit of coaching, was, was helping with the academy and, you know, but for COVID, I'd, I'd still be there now, probably happily with the family and listening to my kids speak French better than me. And that was, uh, yeah, it was, it was all part of it. Yeah, no, no, it sounds amazing. But obviously we see the sort of the, the strength of French rugby at the moment. Are you surprised at sort of how dominant they are as a team with you sort of being in that culture? You've seen, you'll, you'll have been around some of the players that are now really stepping up in the international stage. Do you see some, some of those players coming through? Yeah, and so yeah, like to answer your question, am am I surprised? Not at all, not at all. Like I, um, you know, w- when I got there, obviously French rugby wasn't in great shape in terms of their performances performances internationally, but man, you you could see pretty uh, easily coming to a club like that, just the amount of talent that was around, 
um, it, they were, you know, a, a sleeping giant as they were, they were labelled. And yeah, I, I could just see that they needed a little bit of organisation, a little bit of direction at, at the top. And um, because, you know, com compared to New Zealand, like New Zealand, and people would ask me, you know, I arrive in France, oh, what's it like in New Zealand? You have all these great players and, but, you know, I'd, I'd always just have to stop them and say, look, we, we've got hardly any players. We, <laughs> all we have, is, but because of that, we know we need to get the very best out of everything we've got. And so we have a unbelievable, you know, system, um, yeah. which, you know, goes from the bottom in terms of the, the young club grade, school grade, right to the top. There's great coaching. It's a great organisation. And, you know, and, and that, is reflected in the performances in France. It was the complete opposite. You had so many great kids, so many great players all, all through the ages, but at the, the top at that stage, it, it just wasn't, you know, there was, they had too much, too much to pick from. And so they were picking players and dropping players and picking coaches and dropping coaches. And, and there seemed to be no consistency. And, but that, and that's all I think they've done over the last few years. And, um, you know, they've got a bit of stability at the top and they've got consistency around their selections and, and the performances are, are going to follow. So, yeah, it's, it, and it's been great to see. Like, I mean, I was there long enough. I've, I've got a bit of French about myself. I'm, my daughter's French, you know, she was born over there. So, you know, I'm, I'll always be an All Black, but I, I do enjoy seeing the French team playing well. And, um, and yeah, I, I think it's good for world rugby, you know, because they play a good brand of rugby. So, um I've, I've enjoyed their success. So your daughter could grow up and play for France. <laughs> How would that go down? I don't think it's that straightforward. Anyone that knows goes through a visa application. Yeah. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot more to it than that. But um, but certainly she she's got a bit of French about her, her attitude and that. We always commenting that you can tell she's born in France. But uh, no, I mean it's 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 like I said before. We'd we'd still be there. If not for the way the world um, turned upside down, but um, and and we'd like to get back. Obviously, now it's it's going to be more maybe more like a holiday than um, to live there again. But uh, it was certainly yeah, it was it was a great great time, got a great experience for the family. I think anyone that listens to this is now aware there's a holiday home for let in Po. You know, <laughs> <laughs> there's a rental there. I've, for... <laughs> I've got a, I've got a I've got an Aussie boy play a, a player that's um, looking after it for me. So. That, that was a that was a relief because it was a few months. It was a bit stressful being stuck in New Zealand and having a car and a house and furniture and all over in France. But we slowly sorted it out. Yeah. So how um, are you keeping up to date with the Six Nations? Have you been watching? Yeah, any of those I, games? Um, yeah. Well, so I'm with the international rugby players now. Yeah. So I've, um, as part of that role, it's good to you know keep in touch with rugby all around the world. So I try to try to watch um, games, you know, not just down here now that I'm in New Zealand, but um, games in the in the Northern Hemisphere. And, and to be honest, you know, after leaving, once you learn about the clubs and learn about the teams a lot more, yeah, I, I, I watch a lot more than I, I ever did when I was, you know, before I had my time in France. So um, we'll watch, yeah, one or two uh, of the Six Nation games every, every weekend when it's played. And um, it's a bit of work as well. So I'd Get it. Luckily, we we uh, do have a, a a database or a sorry, what do you call it? Where, where we can watch the games, yeah. Um, you know, without having to watch it televised, which you can. I can fire through a game in about twenty five minutes if I'm uh, skipping the breaks, and <laughs> so I, I do that way. And and I'll still, you know, watch the you know, top fourteen premiership game as well. It's um, it's good for me to know what's going on. And just obviously with New Zealand rugby being the number one sport, is how how much away from you and what you do, is the Six Nations watched? Do a lot of Kiwis sit down and watch the Six Nations, time zones and, and challenger factors, but is it sort of viewed highly? Is it well regarded, that's, that competition? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I'd, more and more, I think it is. I Certainly, like for me, growing up, you know, it was Six Nations, you know, you knew of the competition, but that was it. You never watched games. I don't even, you know, when... Me growing up, we're going back 30 years now. <laughs> so, uh, it, obviously, like now you'll get all the games televised, but they're in the middle of the night. Um, you, you'll get, they'll get replayed. They'll, um, you know, and there is a fair few, not just the expats, there are Kiwis that will enjoy watching it. 
Um, particularly now, I think they're seeing, you know, how well the, the rugby is. I think there was a bit of a view that the rugby was pretty boring, but that was, you know, probably a decade ago. And, and now, and particularly the, the form of, of the Six Nations sides, you know, they're on a par now. You know, I think we've all seen even the last internationals um, they were slightly better than the Southern Hemisphere side. So that, that all helps. So, yeah, to answer the question, it, it is watched. It's not, it hasn't got a huge following, but I, I think that's just due to the, like you said, the, the time zone and yeah. um, more than anything else. Yeah, and guys like James Lowe, obviously that'll be a player you're familiar with playing for Ireland and, and doing well, you know, international player stepped up, didn't he? And it's, good, it's good to see. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, and there's a, f a few like like himself um, and even over the past few years. So, I th yeah, and, and you're right, that that does um, add, a, add a bit of interest. Um, you know, Kiwis are keen to see how those guys go. And and the club scene as well, I think you throw that in there, like there's a lot more, um, particularly in the last sort of 10 years, knowledge or um, viewership of top 14 premiership, you know, the Heineken Cup, like that, that, that was never really, you know, when that was first started, that was never really even shown or known about. Whereas um, team, you know, people in New Zealand know a lot more about clubs, whether that's because players are going over, you know, they've heard, oh, he signed a contract with Munster or, you know, whoever it is, they now know most of the clubs in, in Europe and w which ones are strong and, you know, um, things like that. And was, was, Coming across here, coming to the UK or France, was that ever on the radar during your career? Did you ever look to, to leave New Zealand? Or were you always sort of set in stone and going to keep that All Blacks career going? Yeah, I, I was. And uh, I, I'm not really sure why that was. I mean, there was, you know, players while I played um, were often going. and But it wasn't even something I looked at. And, and I maybe, maybe because I maybe thought that if I looked at it, then I'd, maybe be tempted by it and and I just knew I loved playing for the All Blacks and um, I also considered myself a bit um, more fortunate in that I'd come you know I'd, I'd been to a university and come out with a degree and then sort of went into rugby and it was my hobby you know it, it wasn't uh, a life choice so it wasn't like I was trying to eke out every little penny from rugby because then I was gonna retire and do nothing Rug rugby was a sport and I wanted to play for the All Blacks, so I was going to stay and play for the All Blacks, and then after that, I'd do something else. You know, it wasn't um, rugby and or nothing for me. So, yeah, that 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 was always my attitude, and it was only right, literally, in my last year. And as I said before, I didn't want to play the All Blacks, um, and that and that was just lifestyle um, because you know I was spending six six months on the road by the, you know, in a World Cup year. Um, but even in, a, in other years, you're sort of three months. Um, and so, you know, you start looking at going overseas and, and we were thinking about just going overseas to live, um, you know, aside from rugby. So, yeah, it, it was just an opportunity with, with the club that um, ended up, you know, making me make that decision. I enjoyed the... Um... Enjoy the way you got to the All Blacks. It's maybe not the most conventional. You, 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 can I say you got good quick? You, you, had, a, you, you had a really yeah. quick, pro, really quick progression, and and didn't didn't do the sort of nineteens and the, the young All Blacks and all that sort of stuff. And and then you were there. You were on tour. Yeah. Well, I think at, at the end of uh, two thousand and four, I'd played more All Black tests than um, Super Rugby games. So I don't, I don't think the yeah. so I don't, I don't need but yeah you're right I uh I didn't come through any um age group sides but I mean I was small um I was still a halfback because that was the only position I could play right up until I left uh, high school and and even you know my first few years when I sort of shifted to the midfield I was very lean <laughs> to put it that way and then yeah so the, the development happened very late um played a first class game you know even then it was like most sportsmen will tell you timings timing's a beautiful thing and i i um the the all blacks team were away in 2003 with the world cup and that sort of gave me an opportunity because the uh province i was in had the three all black midfielders so suddenly there was opportunities that's just when um i was playing the club rugby as you know in new zealand that's the very low level um, and got picked into the my provincial side 
Um, and then, yeah, got picked into my Super Rugby out of that. And then the All Blacks out of that when I'd only played one game for, for the Hurricanes and that was off the bench. So it must have been yeah, a good it uh, must have been a good game for you. You must have done something <laughs> that caught the eye. No, or no. But I, I suppose because I either, either side of that, I, I had played so that provincial side, um, I'd had two great years with them. And again, it was timing. It was because I was coming into a really good uh, Wellington team. I looked good because you know we were winning. We made the finals both year. Um, that I played and, and it was on the back of that form that, that I made the All Blacks, which is pretty uncommon nowadays because, you know, Super Rugby has grown a lot more and, and you know, the, there's not a lot of um, All Blacks that even play for their provincial teams. Um, it's only it's only a franchise and the All Blacks. But, um, yeah, that's the way it worked out for me. And, and it was great because I, I actually didn't, you know, I've said this before that I, when I started with the All Blacks, I didn't, I was obviously nervous, but I didn't. I, I didn't feel a whole lot of pressure because it had happened so quickly that I just kept enjoying myself, you know. And, and and you know, there were people around me, the coaches, just kept saying, "Just doing what you do, like don't change a thing." And so I didn't have that feeling, which I see in some players, where you know, especially if you've been trying, like knocking on the door of the All Blacks for a long time, or you know, at that level, sort of borderline all black you know and then you finally make it and there's that brings with it a lot of expectation or pressure that you put on yourself but for me honestly it was just it was so fast that I just was like wow I'm just gonna keep having fun keep doing this because it's it seems to be working and and then you know it, it, it did and um it, I, I think it helped me just uh you know enjoy those early games and and keep having a, a good attitude and not and not putting too much pressure on myself and one of those players you mentioned that was away on um, World Cup duty, obviously, Tana Umanga. What was it like yeah. having him at the Hurricanes? And having, I mean, did you spend a lot of time with him? Or what was the sort of makeup having a guy like that playing in, I mean, obviously centre playing around where you were looking to play to sort of learn yeah. from him and, and get all the skills? Yeah. Oh, he was, yeah, huge, huge influence um, on, on my career. It was um, So you're right, so I came into that. The Wellington side, he, he was there. He was obviously away with the All Blacks a bit, but then um, when he came back, and, and that was the thing, he he would normally, um, when I sort of established myself, he'd, he'd play at 12 and I'd play 13. And so I had, it was two or three years, and, and the same in the All Blacks, the games that I would play would be normally with Tana at 12 and myself at 13, and just a, you know, a legend to, to look up to, but to play alongside. And, and again, you know, I talk about those early experiences for the All Blacks, like it was always with him and it, you know, it was just such a calming influence. And um, he'd be the one in my ear telling me, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. Don't try and be any different. You know, you're 15 kgs lighter probably than the other players in your position, but it doesn't matter, you know, do what you do well. That was the thing he always told me, do what you do well. And, and um, so, yeah, it was, uh, it was great, you know, ha having someone like that next year. And then obviously he retired um, pretty early in my career, but his influence, you know, was certainly a, a lasting one. I mean, as I said at the start, sort of following your career and, and reading up on uh, on yourself before you come on the show, when did you realise that your fitness would have to be on point when you maybe weren't that big a fan of the gym? <laughs> I, I think I think that was very early on. I think um, yeah, I I just knew, and, and I suppose there was some good coaches around me, like you know Wayne Smith, um, Graham Henry, Steve Hansen. So that was the group that brought me in, obviously, to the All Black environment. And their big thing was like knowing your strengths and and just you know not just your weaknesses and and working on those and and you know fitness was my obvious strength. It was even you know when I was a young kid, I was I was running um, and you know I was small, but I could run around everywhere and 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 that's what I sort of had to build my my rugby game around. And it was sort of like work rate because I was never gonna quite have the um, explosiveness and, and power of the other guys in, in the same position and and yeah and 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 as much as that like like you say it was sort of I remember joining you know rugby like the hurricanes for the first time and you always start a season with testing you know strength testing fitness testing 
And I was so embarrassingly bad in the gym that it was, <laughs> it was almost like, right, because you'd always do your strength testing first, fitness testing, I would just have, you know, I'd be so determined to, because I, I just thought, why am I even here? These guys are all looking at me thinking, what is this dude doing? And um, it, it, <laughs> I just had to perform. And um, yeah, so I was always dead last in the strength testing. So I always had to make sure I was first in the fitness testing. And what were you like as a young buck going into these sort of established squads? Were you were you noisy? Were you loud? Were you a talker? Or did you just get your job done? What, what would you do? Yeah, no, I, was, I was very, very quiet. Um, you know, I took a long time. Even, you know, you look at the end of your career and I was, I was captain with Hurricanes and sort of leadership group with All Blacks for, oh, I don't know how long it was by the end, but it, it was something I, you wouldn't have picked that when I started. It, it was, um, and, and I suppose that's a, it's a personality trait. I, I, I don't mind, you know, speaking on, on things or issues if I'm, but I have to be really certain. I have to know what I'm um, talking about and be absolutely confident that what I'm saying is, is on the money. So, you know, I, I spent years just listening, making sure I was going to fit in, um, learning, you know, knowing that if I was going to speak up, um, you know, like, like I said before, I knew exactly what I was talking about and it was, it, I could back it up with either experience or reasoning that was sound um, and, and almost to a fault, you know, I took a long time before I took any leadership roles and um, after, you know, five or six years and even the club environment, it was, it was coaches pushing me to, you know, come on, you can be a leader now, but um, because you know, like like I say, that was just who I was, very very quiet and um, all, almost overly guarded about overstepping the mark or speaking out of turn. Um, so yeah, it, it was it was just a lot of listening and learning early on. Well, that's, that's interesting. But obviously, you did the you did your work on the pitch, and and, player, and boys and players would follow you in that regard. You know, because yeah, you, you, you led a lot of the defence, didn't you? Yeah, but and again, I think that was it was something that that took a long, long time, um, you know, to build up both for myself the confidence to sort of take that sort of role, and but also the respect, the respect from other players, you know, isn't easily earned. You, you sort of um, they need to see you, and and someone you know like like myself um, starting out, you know, I came into both the you know, Hurricanes and the all black environment without a lot of history, you know, they didn't know about me. Um, and I didn't look the most intimidating figure. So yeah, I had to uh, just, just take my time and um, build respect just with consistent performances, I suppose, and, and a good work ethic that that's, uh, you know, what, what I sort of prided myself on and, and that takes time for, for other people to see that sometimes. So, um, but yeah, that, that's the way I went about it. Was there a, when you started playing with Man Onu, was there a point when the pair of you realised, oh, this is, we need to dig in here and keep this going? Was there, like, you became this integral part to the All Blacks, sort of the centre partnership that was feared around the world, that was the top, you know, I could, I could throw all the compliments, you know what I'm trying to say. Was there a point when the two of you would sit yeah. down and say, look, yep. we've got a long time ahead, we've got a good career here, if we can stick together? I, th I think, um, yeah, definitely after, it was... 2008, really, when um, we, we were paired um, as an all-black midfield, um, because up until that point, you know, we so we had played three or four years together by then, but like uh, we were saying before, Tana was, well, he was in the mix early on, um, so, you know, for me to push my get my spot on the team, I'd be 13, Tana would be 12, and then Ma'a was actually playing on the wing, and he didn't want to play on the wing, so it was a, it was an unusual relationship, and we laugh about this now, because, you know, we're great mates, but we, we both admit, early on, we were competitors, you know, we were yeah. teammates, but we both wanted to be playing alongside Tana, and, 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 and that's, you know, people forget this, but so Ma'a wasn't even in the team in 2007, the All Black team um, that went to that World Cup. And then it was only, um, so Tana had obviously retired by then, but the All Blacks were, were looking elsewhere for midfield partnerships. Um, Aaron Major was playing a lot at 12, but he retired in 2007. And so it was 2008 that 
and and the, again that same all black um, trio of coaches sort of talked to us and said, look, we're, we're going to start you Ma at 12. Um, and he didn't play a lot at 12. Um, and, you know, I'd keep playing at 13. And and that was their plans for the All Blacks midfield. And, um, yeah, from then on, it, and, and it, again, it, it took time. It wasn't like straight away we had a great chemistry or anything. We um, we, we were just, and I've, I've said this a number of times when, when asked about the partnership and that, I, to start with, we were just both very determined individually to, you know, be be good All Blacks. Um, and so that's how it started. But I think the coaching and ourselves realised that there was real value in, in building an understanding of each other and, and, and that, you know, that sort of blossomed, I suppose, with time. You, you, we realised we did know each other pretty well. And then when we started talking about it and, and just got a better and better understanding of each other and, and just little things that we could pick up and, and help each other even during a game. Um, yeah, we, we, we started doing that and, and that um, was really beneficial, I think. And, and what about the access with, with Dan Carter at 10? How did you, I mean, you must have loved and enjoyed that having Dan at 10, but how did, how did you see that sort of evolving throughout your career? Just the, the three of you there and didn't put any of the other players around you. But that sort of 10, 12, 13 link of, of, of quality was I mean, unstoppable. I mean, the, the history is there. It was well. How, do you, how much did you enjoy that period? Yeah, like Dan, man, he, he's a special, special player, obviously. Um, I think anyone could see that. But um, and, and, and back to that timing thing, like that, so that, that first tour that I um, went with the All Blacks was the first time Dan had been given the 10 jersey. So you know, I got to most of my, particularly early part of my All Black career was always with Dan at 10. And I, I, I just loved playing with him. Like you, you get asked, I get asked now, are you best All Black or best player you've played with? And and it's always hard to answer because, you know, I've been so fortunate to play with, you know, the Richies and the Jerome Kinos and the, I, you know, I could name a heap, but I, I would always say, you know, honestly, like in terms of, enjoying a game like the guy I'd want to play with because I'm a back would, would be Dan Carter just because I, I you know his vision for the game you know it was something I, I felt like I, I could play off really well you know I, I'd seem to see things and you know and you'd because this is the thing you know everyone talks about communication but the best communication isn't even vocal, you know, it'll, it'll happen because an, an, an instinct in a player will be read by another player, you know, that can see something the same way you do. And I realised that with Dan, you know, I'd, I'd see something and I wouldn't even have to say it. He would have seen the same thing and bang it, whether it's a bit of space and behind the line, he's already put the grubber ahead and, you know, and I'm chasing onto it or it's a, you know, space out wide and he's already thrown the long flat skip pass and, so those those things, yeah. I mean, playing with a guy like that's always special, and 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 I got to play with a few of them. I I know, um, you know, I don't take anything away from the other guys I played with, but um, for for sure, for for Mar and I to be playing with him, it was always um, it's pretty pretty special when the three of us could be together. Yeah, am I right in saying that you uh, were involved the Lions or five when the Lions went to New Zealand? Yeah, yeah. So that I'd just come in to the side. So like I said before, I debuted in 04. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was still very much a, a project as they um as they called me. So they they knew Tana was going to retire. So he had told the All Blacks he'd retire at the end of that year. Um, so they had brought me in as sort of uh, someone to replace. So I, I wasn't I didn't play in the first two tests that was with Aaron and Tana with a midfield. Um, but Aaron Major had injured himself in the second test and so I came in and played um, Tana was 12 and I came in at 13 to play the third test so I got my I got my one Lions cap and that was uh it was special and I tell you that whole I didn't play in those first two weeks but man the the experience of a Lions tour was something else you know and, and it was I, I shouldn't probably say this but as I was a non-player I got to experience it a lot better you know I, I wasn't going out late at night, but I would, I would go and, and enjoy the, like the first test in Christchurch, I just remember the thousands of, you know, these English and Scottish and Irish and Welsh fans that would come into town and, 
And it was just such a, like, a, in terms of memories, it's actually one of my favourite um, memories, that Lions tour. And not, and not so much the third test. I mean, it was great to play a game, but even that whole two or three weeks, um, it, it was pretty special. So we're obviously quite familiar when the Lions are on tour. We, we, we we're following them. We're, we're listening to the news report. What's it like in an All Blacks camp when the Lions are in town? I mean, obviously there's distractions and you get the odd night out, but what's it like in the meeting rooms and the, where the Lions are here? Yeah, oh, it's just it's just a big buzz. Like that's the great thing about you know sport. It, so it's, you know we all all that excitement and um, energy that that you're talking about with the Lions, you know, it's it's sort of infectious. And so that's what I meant by that whole tour, like the whole of New Zealand was caught up in it. And, you know, there's just an extra edge to everything that's done, the trainings, the meetings, the the selection for the team, the, you know, the build up before the Lions had even arrived. There was so much more around, you know, who's the team going to be and um, how's the, how the game's going to go. So, yeah, like I say, and I... Look, I hadn't been. I'm just trying to think. Like, I had. I didn't appreciate how big a thing it was until you know it had come to New Zealand, and then some. And I and I was playing in it. Like it all. As as I said before, three years before that, I was a full time student. You know, this, <laughs> you know, studying and playing club rugby, going to two trainings a week. So this this all happened so quick, and then you know I was in the middle of it and playing in a test match. So. It was it was a great it was a great way to start a career. The speed of the way things progress for you, it's 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 enjoyable to read and to listen to just how quickly it all changed for you. What are your memories, not of your first cap, but of your first hacker? What are your memories? Was that I mean, such an important thing for the for the old blacks to do? And we all love it around the world. But what was that like just before you did your first hacker? Do you remember? Yeah, I, I think it's all man, I like I remember the the whole experience, the test, the hacker, the yeah, it's a, it goes in a blur. I think everyone says the same thing. Um, yeah, yeah, you, especially when it, it's a dream come true, right? So you, yeah, there's a lot of different emotion and energy going through you. And and um, look, I, I I loved. I, I do remember running out to the hacker, and you get that sudden fear that you're going to stuff it up and not do something <laughs> right, but. Like that, that lasts about two seconds and then you're into it. And and I suppose the game, like the, the game's the same. Or you, I think most players are the same. You, you're thinking about, oh, what are you going to do wrong? Or, you know, or what mistakes you're going to make? You don't want to embarrass yourself, but then, you know, things kick off and um, you, you just tear into it. And I think everyone within the All Blacks, you know, you always play well on your debut because uh, everyone's trying to look after you and you, you got that much energy that you um normally get through a right even if you there's a few rough edges but look I, look I was lucky I um had a, had a great great debut and um I didn't stuff the hacker up so who who uh, led your work. hacker who, who led that hacker do you remember oh good question um I'd say it would have been Kivi Mialamu but oh no I could be wrong there don't know don't know should know but I don't Carl Damon, possibly. And have you still got your first strip? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I um, took good care of... I, I gave it to my parents. I gave my first... Um, my debut jersey to my parents and my, my second to my school and third to my club. And then, um, yeah, I've kept the rest... Kept most of the rest of them. So I need to actually do something with them because they uh, <laughs> just stashed away in a couple of bags in the in the attic of my uh, in my house. <laughs> they're they're prized possessions, obviously. You you don't give them away that easily, do you? The old black shirts don't get nah. uh, handed out too easily. Yeah, I I think yeah, it's just sort of a you know yeah, it's just such a respected. Uh, piece, you know, like to to get one, it's it's you know. People work so hard and they'd get anything to, to get hold of one. So I, I think you owe it to, to all of those people to, to look after them. And I, I, I just always, you know, like I have um, given the odd one away, but it's always to people, you know, it's, it's a gift. It's a handing out, it's a treasure. You know, I'm, I'm trying to use, a, I was about to use a Maori word because it's per tonga. It's a, you know, it's a treasured gift. And so like the worst thing, and, and we talk about as if, you know, you ever saw it appear an all black jersey on Trade Me or something. So uh, a Trade Me, which is the 
Yeah, yeah. You, you know, like an eBay, like, like an e- uh, eBay or um, eBay. Yeah. Selling, it. Yeah, selling it, it off. Yeah. Yeah. So that's so whenever you do give it away, it's sort of like on the understanding, like you know, this is for you. Um, Respect because it. You've, yeah. you've done yeah. something for me, and and you look at it's it's for you to keep, not to sell or anything like that. So I, I think most people take the same um, view. And is there any jerseys you've received from players that you, you have the utmost respect from? I'm sure you've got tons of opposition uh, players that you've got huge respect, but shirts that actually mean something to you, shirts in your collection? Yeah, for sure. And, and that's and that's something pretty cool in, in rugby, to be honest. Um, you know, the, the swapping of the jersey. And, and I'd always make sure it was... I'd, I'd go into the changing room and, um, you know, have a, have a chat with the... And normally, as you know, guy John de Villiers, who I played a lot of tests against um, from South Africa, Adam Ashley Cooper from Australia, guys you do have a lot of respect for. And and, and then there's obviously the ones, the Fijian or Portuguese players that, you know, for them, this, it is just, you know, so treated and, and you know, I'm more than happy to to trade to trade that. But same thing, you, you have a chat to them after the game, do it in the changing room and um, I, I also, you know, started swapping. This is towards the end um, with with other players in the team, which I thought was. Um, I think I started something of a tradition because I think the guys still do it. But I, I so I swapped one with Ma'a was the, when we played our fiftieth test together. We swapped jerseys, and I swapped one with Richie and Dan and Kevi Milamu. Um, you know, guys that I'd played a lot of rugby with, and, and that was cool because they're the ones I actually treasure the most. You know, they're the ones I have there that, like, you know, this is a guy to tell my son, you know, because he doesn't know all these guys. But I say, look, these are the jerseys from uh, guys I played a lot of rugby with. And so they're, they're probably um, as special as any. So please tell me they're on a wall somewhere, not in that black bag. <laughs> <laughs> no, they will, they're going on the wall. That's good. <laughs> well, that, that's interesting because obviously all rugby fans have read legacy, you know, the All Blacks and the, and the way that sort of you, you guys do things off the field, the, the standards that you set. And, and if that's a tradition that you sort of started with swapping strips amongst each other and things like that, is there anything else or when leadership groups sort of change within the All Blacks, do they all sort of add something to the culture or is it very much the All Blacks way and it's you stick to that? Or are, are other things allowed to come in and influence the way the All Blacks evolve? Yeah, I think a bit of a bit of both. Like, um, I, and I think it is something special about the all black culture. And there's obviously there's things that are really special, and and you honour them, and and part of the tradition. And you know, whether it's the we talk about the blackness of the jersey or the the, the silver fern on your chest, you know, th- those things you have to honour, and and they are all part of what makes the all blacks special. You know, you hundred years or more history of, of this you know, tiny country that um, has so much pride and passion about their rugby team and and it's and the results that they've you know we've managed to forge over over that time but no doubt you know there is also that it's it's an evolution it's got to be changing you know you, you, we don't keep traditions just for the sake of it and so if there's something we need to alter to reflect the current makeup of the team or the current um attitude of players like you, you've got to keep doing that you've got to keep moving and and you know we don't always get it right you know it's um and, and it's something that's got to be worked out all the time and the leadership group it's it's a big part of their their role to um i, I suppose honor traditions but also recognize your current culture and and see how you can get the best out of them um within the all black environment so yeah that, that's always that's always going on, and, and I know it does, um, even with this current um, bunch of players and, and management. And how do you look at the current the current squad? Obviously, a tough end to the, the overseas tour last year, but yeah. how do you see the future and things evolving under Ian Foster? Yeah, I'm you know optimistic. I think it, it's a it's a really tough time in sport at the moment. Like that, I don't think you can really shy away from that. Um, I'm glad I'm not playing in it. <laughs> I don't mean to, that to be taken the wrong way, but I just, you know, I'm still close enough to to the game, you know, to see the go, what's going on. But just what the guys, you know, and not, and I'm not just talking about All Blacks here. Like all all sportsmen and all countries and all, all sports, it's uh, it's just a really challenging time. And, and so, and there's challenges that have never been experienced before. So, and, and even like the All Blacks 
last year that tour they went they were I don't know what it was 12 13 weeks away from home like we I remember we did one six week tour we lost our last two it was a, a never again I remember we got home and as a player group we said we'll never tour for that long again and now that you know and then we went on a 13 week but and, and it wasn't we had to you know like the players were all absolutely wanted to do it because otherwise you wouldn't have been able to play any games um yeah. So I, I just, yeah, there, there's a lot of that that's going on, the, the challenge of that tour, the challenge for players at the moment, the uncertainty of um, with missing games, was just not playing a lot of rugby, not training as much as they have in the past. Um, that, that, that's all tough. But um, look, the, the, as far as the, the current group, I think they've got the right people there and it, it's going to be, I, I just hope, you know, we get a real nice, run into this next World Cup because I think, uh, yeah, every, everything's pointing towards it being the most competitive World Cup ever. And, and yeah, and, and it'll be in France, which are amazing hosts, I know, from being there in 07. And so, yeah, like, if, if it can have a nice clean run up where teams will get some really good competitive fixtures in and, and um, it'll, it'll be, yeah, the, be, the best World Cup yet, I think. And it, it's just the way that the All Blacks are is you'll be the team to beat regardless of who's playing well the All Blacks will be the ones that everyone's sort of like when are we playing the All Blacks you know it's, it's the yeah. biggest game yeah and and that's um, yeah that, and that's something I know the All Blacks have, have, have got used to it and I think we cherish we, it, it's tough um, I know you know even look back to 07 and or, and, and another fact, I think there's only once that the, the All Blacks have lost a game in the World Cup and the team that's beaten us has always, except once, lost the following week. And that gives you an idea, you know, that the teams, they peak for the All Blacks, right? They, and that's, that's their final. Like, they won, they won yeah. their final. And, and, they, like and England, then they, they find it very difficult yeah. to win the following, the following week. So, uh, but yeah, look, that, that's something, you know, we, we've learned to cherish rather than fear. Um, it, it makes for great occasions and and you're right there they, uh, even with the form probably over the last 12 18 months has, hasn't been what it had been you know prior to that there, there, there's still a, we, we know any team facing the all blacks will be expecting the well wanting to play their absolute best and um that that, that will be the case at the next world cup and the team's just gonna yeah have to be prepared for it that's it. Speaking of great occasions, have you ever you played at Murrayfield? Oh yeah, yep, a few times. Yep. Any good memories? Yeah, yeah, no, no. I've um, oh, I it, it's funny you say that. I, and I ever I, I don't speak of this often, but when I was a really young, I, I'm talking what was I nine or ten? I had a had a bet with a um, friend of mine, and it was who would be the first to play at Murrayfield. And it's and we're just it's a childhood bet like it was. Yeah. But my, my mate who's still he lives down the road now. He still brings it up all the time because my my first game at Murrayfield he was uh, he was the first one to message me and said you won the bet and, and it's it was just one of those silly bets but it it's always stuck with the both of us. But um, but and and he, hearing you know Flower of Scotland all those it's pretty it's a special special place to play and and I'm a uh, you know. Like I, I, like I say, I've been watching All Blacks, living rugby since I was a young kid. I'm a typical Kiwi lad. So those sort of places and playing Scotland at Murrayfield, it mean, you know, it always meant a heap to me. Um, so e every occasion was was very special. Good on you. Now, one thing, I won't keep you too much longer, Conrad, but one, one thing, I think you get asked this a lot. You're the man, the myth, the legend. You're not on social media. You're hard to find. You're on. I think you're on LinkedIn. You're there. We all saw Richie McCaw as soon as he retired. Boom! He's on social media. He's out there. What's this? What's this story? You like keeping yourself to yourself? You like um, sort of uh, yeah, I, I, out there? I I just um, I I'm pretty happy without it. So it would be a big change. I I just don't. I, I tell you, I don't see any value in telling the world what I'm eating or what I think about <laughs> issues or, yeah, seriously, I just, I'm like, I'm, I'm happy just doing it. You know, I've, I've got people that I'll talk to about issues and I've, I've got work that I enjoy with the Players Association and 
Um, I, I don't really, yeah, I've, I've yet to see the huge benefits of this social media. Like I, I know it's there. I'm not completely ignorant and, and I'll, I'll watch it and follow it. But, you know, my role in it, I'm, I, I don't see... Um, I don't see myself getting involved anytime soon because I, I don't think I'm missing out on anything. So, yeah, yeah. No, that's a refreshing take because I mean, I'm on it with so many. I mean, you're in the minority, it's the way the world is, you know. But if you're happy and, and, and everything's fine, I mean, hey, yeah. Well, it was the thing I used to tell the like other players because, because obviously, there's a lot of harm in it too, right? Like, yeah, there's yeah. a lot, particularly more and more sportsmen are coming out talking about the dangers of it. I just like, well, don't go into it like and and I just was because it all sort of came about while I was playing like it wasn't there when I started and I just kept looking at everyone and like you were saying it was sort of like oh you've got to you you just and and that my issue was is I didn't mind people that like obviously by the end I could see all my teammates I had no issue with the ones that were involved in social media and but I said it's not a it's not a right you don't have to join it like there was people that I saw like that weren't finding the same benefits. And I'd just tell them, look, don't go on it. Like, it's not for everyone. You don't, um, just because you're a sportsman or a rugby player doesn't mean you have to have a social media account and, and have the most followers. Like, it's just, yeah. It's, uh, was was there any crack thing. with Richie when he did, when he did uh, succumb and yeah, yeah. set up an well, account? Well, obviously it was him and I that were the ones that were holding strong and not doing it. And then, <laughs> He actually messaged me and gave me a heads up. He said, I'm just letting you know I'm, I'm cracked and I'm doing social media. <laughs> uh, I said, fair enough, mate, fair enough. But I, I told him I wouldn't be following, so I'm stuck true to it. Oh, good on you. Well, here, Conrad, I really appreciate your time um, for getting back to me, uh, for making this happen. It's been really enjoyable, a real easy conversation, obviously. Congratulations, you've achieved everything you wanted to achieve and uh, all the best with everything you're doing now. Yeah, thank you very much.